Welcome to our podcast, Serve Twice by Choice. My name is Rick Caballero. My co-host today is Al Vivas, Chicago police officer, detective, 25 years on the job. Our special guest today is Gil Carrillo. Uh, Gil is a uh, former uh, Vietnam veteran in the Army and a uh, detective in the L.A. Police Department. L.A. County Sheriff's Department. There you go. So thank you for coming aboard oh, with us and pleasure. being our guest. Uh, we're honored to have you. So let's start out. Uh, I did some research on you. You said you used to be in trouble a lot as a kid. You grew up on the corners, grew up on the, Grew up on the block. Managed to stay away from trouble, but was headed for trouble, and some of the guys did get in trouble, and I was just lucky enough to avoid it until a cop took me home at age 17, told my parents, signed for him to get off the streets, or he's gonna end up dead or in prison. So they did. Now, let me ask you a quick question. When those officers took you home, the police, what did, or your parents, what did they do? One guy had been actually helping me. I was going to fail. I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to graduate, and I'd have been the first one in my family not to graduate. And the English teacher told me, "You write a term paper, and I'll give you a D," which would have been enough just not failing. This cop that used to come around, and what I thought was fun, you know, it was good police work. Put us up on a hood, pat us down, try to talk to us. He said, "If there's anything I can ever do to help you, let me know." I talked. I said, "Hey, I need to write a paper." Would you help me? And I'm going to write it on cops. Yeah. And so he said yes. He went down my house with me. And when he got done helping me, that's when he told my parents. Okay. And the reason I ask you that, because I think you can contest this out. You bring a kid home today, the parents want to know what you did to him. What did you do to my kid? Sure. Or back in the day when I grew up, sure. the police brought me home. My parents didn't ask any questions. No, they no. kicked your ass. Yeah. And said, thank you, officer. And that was it. Something so, when we were kids... Uh, when something happened in school, you know, it was our fault. It wasn't the school's fault, and it was our ass kicking. Right. Today, it's why are you letting my kids do this at school? Right. They're blaming right. somebody else. Right. Exactly. What's going on today's day and age? So from there, you graduate. I I did graduate. Uh, I went straight into the army at age 17. I had my 18th birthday on November 29th, and on February 1st, two months later, I was in Vietnam. No kidding. And uh, that was, uh, there are no winners in war. War is terrible, but it's the greatest thing that happened to me. It gave me a new outlook on life and matured me and gave me a new appreciation. Well, absolutely. It does that for a lot of young men going sure. in there. Vietnam, no boot camp? Well, I went to boot camp. That's where, when I went in at 17, I went in uh, August 31st of uh, 17 and went to boot camp, then went to advanced, uh, I forget what they call it, advanced training, it wasn't infantry training. Uh, my advanced training, which was uh, something called 67N20 single rotor turbine jet engine mechanic, which meant I was a flying crew chief. You know, I, okay. I, I flew. Let's go back to boot camp. Eye opener. Fucking, you're coming from hanging out on the block. To hanging fucking... out on the block to scared to death. <laughs> you know, most of the guys were older than I was. The DIs were yelling. Uh, I thought it was funny when I went to the induction center the day I left. Uh, all the regular army guys that enlisted on one side and the rest of the people that were drafted on the other side, the guys on the other side, they count out by twos and it was one, two, one, two. Okay, all you ones get in the line over here and all you twos stay over here. Ones, you were now members of the United States Army. Number twos, you were members of the United States Marine Corps. Right. And guys started crying in that line. I said, holy shit, why, why are you crying? You know, I... So we got on a bus, drove from L.A. to Fort Ord and it was nice and comfy, it was easy going, and people were laughing, and I'm just, I'm scared, I'm by myself. And then we get to Fort Ord, and these guys get off wearing fucking Smokey the Bear hats and cussing us out and get your asses out. And it was uh, an eye-opener right now. Yeah, and you got a nice head of here now. Imagine back then, and then what they just bzz, bzz, Oh yeah, they just buzzed everybody. Gone, right? <laughs> they buzzed everybody when I was in there. I had injured my knee when I was younger, and I re-injured my knee when I was up in boot camp. They stuck me in a cab. First off, they send me to uh, the doc, and the doc says, okay, we can either put it in a cast and have this taken care of when you get to your next assignment, or give you medical discharge right now. He says, because this has to be taken care of. And I said, Cast it. So we did. I had a cast from the top of my leg all the way down to my ankle, and I did uh, my boot camp 
the last four weeks of boot camp with a cast on. Okay. And I ran, I went on marches, I did everything. Uh, my pits were purple. The DIs would come as I'd be going by, they'd trip me so I could fall <laughs> down intentionally. And they just told me, uh, you can do everything, but they weren't gonna let me graduate because the people in charge of uh, firing the weaponry, they said, he can't qualify, he can't do the position. They said, what do you mean? He said, well, he can't do the kneeling, he can't do the squatting. Uh, it's gonna be tough getting him out of a, you know, anything down the ground. Right. So he would essentially have to stand there and do every shot while standing in position. And my platoon leader, uh, the uh, ops lieutenant for the company I was in said, I'll train him. And he was in the army rifle team. And so he actually trained me just to start making circles with my weapon. And every time I'd come to nine o'clock, squeeze a trigger, just keep going in circles, squeeze a trigger at nine, my weapon had come around. And I missed it by one point getting distinguished expert. So they allowed me to graduate. I didn't get to march in a parade. They took my cast off uh, the morning of the parade. And they said, uh, I said, do I get to march with my company? And they said, no, you get to graduate, but you don't get to march. If we have you march, they're gonna make you go through a physical uh, agility test. Okay. He says, just let it go. My parents were there, so he did. And I got promoted when I got out of there and I asked the DI, I said, why, why did I get promoted? You know? And he says, ah, he says, just because you're a good Mexican. <laughs> you know, I, I just went through everything they, they said, they did. Made E2, there are only about 15 of us that made E2 out of there. And I was one of them, made it, went to my next class, you know, next bit of training. Uh, out of that training, made E4, and they sent me to Vietnam. And I thought it was kind of cool, man. Hey, I'm being promoted. I bypassed E3, bypassed E from E1, I made right. there. And when I got to Vietnam, I realized why they promoted me to four because in order to be a crew chief, get up and fly, you had to be an E4. So they just made all of us E4 so we could get up so and get in combat. So for our guest, an E4 in the Marine Corps is a corporal. What's an E4 in the Army? It's a, they call them Spec 4, Specialist spec 4, but it's essentially a corporal. It's the same thing. Yeah. Spec 5 is a buck sergeant. Okay. And so that's what, uh, that's what I was when I got. And that was all in the mindset just so I could get up and fly, get it, jump into combat. Right, right, right. Um, so boot camp, right to Vietnam, mm. right? Tell us about that. I mean, it, that's- It, it was an eye opener. Uh, there, there were things that I saw. I remember uh, I was just at a Memorial Day service a couple of weeks ago and I go every year, there were 27 men that were killed out of my high school alone. Really? And 10 of them were good friends of mine. And so when I got there at the age of 18, I was stupid. And all I wanted to do was go back there and avenge. I wanted to kill these people, avenge for my friend's death. And that's the mentality of the old gang member, you know, payback. I want to give them payback. And they said, uh, five men, I need five men, five volunteers, search and destroy mission. My hand was the first one up. I couldn't wait. I'm going yeah. out there. And they said, okay, get in that truck. And I'm sitting there saying, wait a minute, where are your guns? You know, where's, where's all this? It was search and destroy. You got in the back of a two and a half ton truck. There were big steel hooks and kerosene in there. And they drove you around the base. You pick up the back door of the odd house, hook that <laughs> cut off 50 gallon drum, pour kerosene in it and burn all the shit that was inside. Yeah. Search and destroy. Wrong, wrong mission. <laughs> I learned, do not volunteer. And uh, next day they sent me to my unit where I flew. And yeah, what year is this year in Vietnam? 68, right at the beginning of Tet Offensive. Oh, you're not even born yet. No, no. I'm uh, born in 72. And I'm, I'm, I'm 64, so I'm four years old. Um, yeah. It's kind of crazy. It, but, um, it, was, uh, it was good. I remember my, my first day in, in, in the unit in Pleiku, assigned to the 189th uh, Ghost Riders, you know, 189th Assault Helicopter Company. And I remember they gave me a top bunk and I got in the top bunk and went to sleep. And I'm saying, holy Jesus, I'm here. This is where the war is at. And, you know, what's it going to be like? And before I know it, I hear sirens going off and then I hear bombs exploding. I know, what the heck? Yeah. And they were shooting mortars and rockets on our base. And so somebody's yelling, incoming, and everybody's running for the front door because we had a bunker right outside underground, outside the front door. Well, shit's going off and all I could think of was low crawl. So I got down on my belly and I started low crawling 
And by the time I got to the front door, it was all over with. And I was bleeding because I was scraping up my knees and shit on the concrete. Imagine, yeah. And a guy standing right there at the door, not, not flinching at all, said, eh, welcome to the NOM, kid. You'll get used <laughs> to this shit. Now, Gil, is this a daily basis that they're sending these rounds in? In, in the, uh, during the Tet part, it was daily. Crazy. Yeah, we were getting, we were getting a lot of, a lot of, a lot of shooting going on all over yeah. the place. Yeah, I, I, you know, it, it's, I've never been to war. I've been in the service, like I said several times. Uh, I can only imagine how crazy it is, how it wasn't, horrible it is at times. It, it, you know, I, I can't complain. You know, I, I, like I said, war is hell. There's no winners. But I would actually, I, I felt sorry for the guys on the ground, the, as they called them, grunts, infantry mm -hmm. and artillery and those guys, because they had to live out in the boonies. They had to, you know, you're getting shot at. How far can you run? Yeah, they dealt with all the shit. Yeah, and so now I get out and I get in a helicopter. And I fly out, I maybe insert some troops or extract troops from hot landing zones and you're getting shot at and you're shooting back. But when you're done, you know, it's like two minutes away from that fire hole, you're up and it's safe. I mean, nobody's chasing you. There's yeah. not, not somebody in another helicopter or planes, jets trying to shoot you out of the sky. You just fly back at the end of the night, re rearm your ship, refuel it, go bed. They call them hooches, you know, they're little Quonset huts with sandbags all around them. I got to sleep indoors. We had armed forces television. So you'd go out, you'd fly, you'd come back, go into the hooch and turn on the television and get to watch combat. You know, okay. so it was uh, the laugh, laugh in was a show, combat was a show. And they'd say the show the same show, you know, three or four times a week, but it didn't matter. Right. It didn't matter. We had a refrigerator in there, it was loaded with beer. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was so nice. You had a mean compared, yeah, like you said, exactly. the out on the field. And so therefore, you know, I, I've often said my best Thanksgiving, even to this day, was spent in Vietnam. We were flying hot meals to the troops out of the field. And the flight commander came by and says, okay, you guys have been flying all day. We have time for one, one more mission. There's still one more load to go out. If you take that out, you guys don't get hot meals. So you can, you've done work, stay here, you have your own Thanksgiving dinner or get that one out. And everybody, the man said, let's get this one out. We had to go out and feed them. And we came back in and once we refueled, rearmed, went to the hooch and we got there, they said, hey, Soapy wants you in the mess hall. And it was Sergeant Soapy who was a mess sergeant and it was all closed up, but he wanted us down and we went down and opened the door. All of his Vietnamese helpers were gone. Everybody else was gone. The lights were out. He had candle, there were candle lights in there. And he had Thanksgiving dinner for us. Wow. And, uh, excuse me, <laughs> you're no, still. You're, you're uh, perfect. So he, he, he had a hot meal for you. Yes. That's awesome. He said, my boys ain't going without eating hot turkey. Yeah. So That's cool. it was good. Yeah. And uh, so you just go back to the grind and, and then, I finally, uh, I did this for five or six months, re, uh, resupply and medevacing people out. Uh, one day I'm flying, we were using this Agent Orange to hear so much about. We had a bladder loaded in my helicopter and we're defoliating rice patties. And as we're flying over rice patties, shooting this Agent Orange to kill the rice because they were using the rice to feed the right. North Vietnamese regulars. And we flew over and a guy jumped out from one of the dikes and he started shooting, hit my helicopter three, four times before I was able to react and return fire and I hit him. And that's the only Vietnamese soldier that I ever saw. Because when you're shooting, you're shooting in the jungles. You, know, you right. don't see anybody, they're down. This guy jumped up, no protection. I uh, shot Just him. Just praying and praying. Yeah, right. and bam, hit him, saw him, flop, saw him take a, a loop. We got back that, and then as soon as you do that, well, you got to pull up and out because the big boys, the gunships come in and they yeah. destroy everything. And so I just told them, I said, you know what, I'm tired of running. I want to go, I want to fly with the big boys. So I went to gunships after that. Okay. And uh, that was really a lot of fun. <laughs> just what, destroying stuff? So it was you know, rock, you, you, get in, you get fire almost on a daily basis. You know, you're out and you're getting shot at a lot more, but it was, it was fun. 
Yeah. You know, it, it, was, it was like a game. And that's what you looked at it and only. And the first day I went out in a helicopter on a gunship, I had uh, one of the links that hold the bullets together. It's like sticking your arm out of a driver's side of the window on a freeway and the wind, well, my, heli my gun were sticking out of the helicopter like that. The wind blew back a link and jammed my gun. And so we completed our circle. We daisy chains, you go in loops and my gun got jammed. So he, by the time you come back around, you have to be ready to go again. And I wasn't ready to go. I couldn't get it unjammed. And so we made it again and I finally got it unjammed. And when we landed, uh, first day flying with him was Captain Tom Stemke. And he reminds me today of Tom Cruise, the way Tom Cruise is small and got in the guy's face. Well, he come up and he got in my face and told me that uh, you got to learn real quick in Vietnam. If you panic, you die. And he will not have it. He'll sit me down. You, we can't have that be happening. You, you're an integral part of this four-man team. We depend on each other and we need you. And he chewed me out, a few choice words, and all I did was sit there and take it. When he turned around and he walked away, I sat there and said, he's right. Yeah. And so well, what I, could you have done different there would have changed that? You I, I, would have, I would have had tools with me like a screwdriver. Uh -huh. I would have had gloves, rags, something to hold that barrel to get it out. Yeah. Something prepare. I wasn't. I had never yeah. done this. And so I learned real quick and get jammed right here before I made that next loop. Before I made the turn, I got to jam it. Right. You know, and then what I did do was that I get a new gunner and it wasn't too bad with him because now he's on a passenger side of the car. So all the, uh, all the casings fly out on the right side of the gun. So the wind is blowing them away from him. Gotcha. But in case you have to come over on this side, if I'm hurt, anything else, you got to be prepared. So teach them. So won't get them with their pants yeah, down like no, I was. That's, that's, that's crazy stuff. I was going to ask, so you were in Vietnam, you're a kid off the street. Now you volunteer for service? Yes. Yes. So you, you end up in a helicopter and you, you have to learn real quick how things work around there. Right? Sure. You've already learned not to volunteer, right? Yeah. Things. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of time to think about what's next, right? And maybe in life, what I'm saying. It's like, what am I, what am I doing here? And what's, what am I going to do when I get out? Do you ever have those thoughts? No, the only thought I did have, uh, you didn't have time to think. You know, it's kind of like the brotherhood of cops. When you're at work, you're thinking about work. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about what you're going to do you know, mm -hmm. elsewhere, you know, in life, you, mm -hmm. I didn't even, I couldn't think that far ahead thinking about uh, retirement, you know, that was like so far away. Right. While you're over there, you're thinking about things to do to stay alive. Right, the next day, that, yeah. That's all, you, that's all you're doing. You're maturing, your, your fellow aviators and crew members, uh, you become a brotherhood and you're together. You stick together through thick and thin, you depend on each other for life. You learn on a daily basis how to appreciate life you learn how to mature. You learn what is important and really what isn't important. Somebody catching the bad cold or back home or with the flu or COVID, we didn't have COVID then, but anything like that was not really important. Right. You know, I was able to help start an orphanage when I was back there. It broke my heart that I could see little eight, nine, 10 year old little boys trying to learn how to shoot gun to protect their village. Yeah. And so we started an orphanage back there and we taught them how to shoot guns. Uh, so we do that in our spare time. If we had to make ammo runs or anything like that, stop by and the bill and the orphanage we started is still going today. Wow. That's and, amazing. Uh, so we did that. And then once I got out of there, all I thought about was what I did want to do when I got out. Once you weren't thinking about combat, you're out, you're thinking about what are you going to do? And I had uh, three goals. I wanted to uh, go to college. And nobody in my family, no cousin, nobody had ever gone to college. And I was naive thinking at that time that only rich white people went to college, but I wanted to go. And I knew I would mature because I sent for my high school transcripts and I was embarrassed. When I read them, I obviously thought when I was in school, D stood for damn good. And uh, <laughs> F was fabulous. So uh, they let me into the local junior college because I was a vet. And the third one was, well, I, I want to go to college. I wanted to become a cop because I wanted to give back what that cop gave me, gave me my life. And I wanted to be able to touch somebody else like he had touched me. 
And third and last thing that does make people happy is I wanted to hook up with my ex-girlfriend that wrote me a Dear John when I was in Vietnam. I wanted to get her read out of the palm of my hand and then break it off with her because I wanted revenge. I wanted to see her suffer. And I got out of the Army June of 1970. By September of 70, I had her eaten out of the palm of my hand. The day after Christmas 1970, we got married. <laughs> and we just celebrated our 51st wedding anniversary oh, this last Christmas. That's awesome. Yeah, that's good. So going back to Vietnam, do you have something? I was going to ask, do you ever reconnect with that police officer that uh, impacted you? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Uh, I was working gangs, uh, street gangs in East L.A. It was a soft, closed assignment, had longer hair, and I had just come out of the jail interviewing somebody, and I come into the booking area, and he looked at me. I tried finding him right away when I got out, and he was no longer in the sheriff's department. And so I didn't know what had happened to him. They said he uh, had retired. He was gone. And so now, can't find him. I come out of the booking area, and there's Al in a suit. And he goes, Gil. I said, Al, Al Arias. And he says, Gil, no, I heard you had done good. And I said, <laughs> Al, I did. Lifted my shirt and showed my badge, and we both hugged and cried. Oh, so, that's awesome. So it was cool. So he thought you were coming out as a, like a yeah, prisoner. Yeah, he, like he thought I was in the jail. <laughs> and uh, my wife got the chance to meet him. I got the chance to meet his wife. And he tells my wife, we met in a store parking lot. And he said, Miss Creel, he says, you don't realize how far I go back with your husband. And she says, oh, what I do, and I want to thank you. And so yeah. tears all over the place all over again. So, yeah, yeah, I did get to thank him, and I did get to see him. He had gone to work for, he had left, uh, retired from the sheriff's department. I think it was a medical issue. Uh, but then he became a detective for L.A. City Schools. Not quite real police work, but he was right. working for the schools. And that's where I bumped into him. That's how it was. He was good. Well, that's awesome. That's a great story. It's nice to have somebody look out over somebody. We had a guest here, Oscar Navarro. He had a Marine Corps guy, mentor him, get him into the Marine Corps. Um, and he's been a good guy ever since. You know, and Not that he was in ever trouble, but he came from Honduras and didn't speak English. Um, so you get out of Vietnam what year? I got out of Vietnam 1969. They sent me to Fort Stewart, Georgia. Okay, and then how long are you in the service before you get out of the Army? I was in there, I got out uh, 1970. August, I got out June of 70. They gave me a three month drop because I was going to go to college. Okay. June of 70, I got out. And speaking of college, when you said they let you in because you were a vet, Vietnam, they, wow, how'd you take that transaction from the war to civilian life? Were they baby killer in you? Uh, you know? that, was, that was tough. You didn't tell anybody anything about what you did, and you just stood away from people. I was reluctant, anti, yeah, yes. because a lot right. of anti-sentiment for Vietnam veterans. Right, right. You know, we, we were baby smart. killers. Yeah. That's what they said. You're baby killers, warmongers, yeah. and don't do that stuff. So you could, at that time in my life, you could protest anything you wanted to in the world, and I didn't care. But don't protest Vietnam because now you get me pissed. Yeah. And so I just had to stay away from it, and I didn't talk to anybody about what I did. Kind of like the way it is now, now that I'm retired from police work, where a lot of anti-cop sentiment, you know, defund the police, and uh, so you don't tell anybody you're a cop or retired cop, you know, and you just don't. When did you join the police department? I swore in October 1st, 1971. 71. And you're how old now? 72. No, how old are you? I'm at 70. Time. Oh, at, at that time, time I was 20, uh, October, I was 21. 21. So still a baby, kind of. You know, sure. When, when you think about it, um, 21 going into the police department, how was that academy compared to what you're hearing about nowadays? Uh, when I went through the academy, my class was the first official non-stress class to go through. That's what they said. That being said, they wouldn't yell at or anything while you were on the police academy facility. But once they ran you off that facility, you go out, they they did everything. That, <laughs> they reminded me of DIs in boot camp. Really? And I was scared to death up until the day I graduated because I needed this, you know, I'm there. This is a job. This is going right. to be my livelihood. So I didn't want to screw up. I was upset. A lot of the guys had been through the service, but most of the females hadn't. So females didn't realize what, what 
the payback was when you wouldn't shut up, you wouldn't dress right, your clothes, your shoes weren't shining good, right. and everybody pays. And so we we're not all the I don't want to use a wide sweep brush, but a lot of them didn't, and it was it was frightening to me until the day we graduated. Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, I had the pleasure of um, going out to Orange County, California, and doing a mini academy with the Orange County Sheriff's Office. So for the people that don't understand or explain, um, can you explain what the Stress Academy is? Stress Academy is when they the DIs would come and get in your face, just like just like boot camp. You know, they'd wear the Smokey the Bear hats, and they'd come and they'd get in your face. Uh, they. They remember, I remember uh, my fellow cadets had an ant crawling on his uniform and they got him on his face and their favorite thing was, okay, prior to tomorrow morning formation, you will write a one page essay uh, on ants, on this particular ant. And so he had to, and we want it with you, we want you carrying that ant with you every day. <laughs> he will go through the academy with you. So the next day he comes back, man, I've done my research, we need to find another ant. These ants only live 24 hours. <laughs> And so we got another ant, put it in the tube, and here it is, sir. And so the ramrod, the sergeant for the class, he comes in and he says, where's that ant? You have a name for it? And he says, yes, sir, Smedley. He says, where's it at? He says, right here, sir. He says, let me see it. Put it out there. So he put it on the desk on a white piece of paper. He lit it out to let the ant start running around. The ice smashed it. And he says, that's what I think of your ant. And he walked out. Well, our tack officer then comes up and he says, that's a murder. <laughs> Prior to tomorrow morning formation, you will write a, you know, a murder of what just happened, what you witnessed, and we want, I want proper proper services of that for that ant, Smedley the ant, and I can never forget somebody drew up an ant with cross bandoliers, you know, across his chest. <laughs> they got an old um, pen case. They used to put pens on it, like a white background and the pens to look nice, just right. So put the ant right there and you could see it. And Smedley the ant, little flags. They put him on display just like, you know, you're paying your respects, made everybody go in front of the goddamn thing. The females in the class had to cry. And then they got the thing and they had crossed uh, batons as they walked through that ant and they had full funeral rites right there outside <laughs> you know, crazy. so they they did stuff Those to us. Those are stories that uh, I sure. can believe. You can't you can't write a story. No, like they, that. that and that's that's what they did, but they wouldn't do it where any of the executives could see this stuff. Right. You know, and, and I remember them running us off, and they, front leaning rest position, and they would get us down there. And he said, "So no more stress. Stress is supposed to be stricken from your vocabulary. Well, insert highly disciplined. You guys will become highly disciplined." Start pounding them out. Get down. One, you know, and, and they'd do push-ups. They'd make you run to the point of exhaustion. Uh, they just beat you and make you yeah, do stupid was, stuff. Our chemistry was pretty tough when we went through. Yeah. And, and then when they went to non-stress, then there's no more yelling, no more treating like this. They treat you nice, coddle you. And back then they said stress was to try to get you prepared for what you're going to run into out in the streets. Mm -hmm. Well, with a new social outlook on life, the way it was trending much nicer, kinder police department. And that's what you're, you, you were saying now, right? You're seeing a little bit yes. more of a friendlier police force, and it's for a lot of different reasons, policy-wise, uh, public perception. Um, but, you know, I was always of the opinion that you need to be prepared for the real, real life scenario of the job. Sure. Right? So yes. something like a stress account. And you should be. You know, you're gonna hear things, you're gonna be treated in certain ways that prepares you for everyday life in the field. Do you think it's a disadvantage now that... I, I have no idea since I'm out of it. Mm -hmm. I'm not a doctor of the psychology that goes behind it. Uh, somebody did it. I know when you get out there in the field, the first thing you're assigned, it takes about six months to get off training once you get to a radio car. So you learn real quick that this is reality. They learn what's going on, whether it helped or didn't help. Uh, I don't know. Hopefully a lot of that stuff came before you ever got to an academy about how to treat people. I think it made for, uh, there was some good aspects of it where you, you could take a little more before jumping off and getting into somebody's face, you might take a little more verbal abuse before you did that. Uh, you can always get angrier, but it's easier to be kinder and work up to that anger than it is just to be angry and then 
back down. So I don't know whether it did good or no good. I know what I went through and I made it and I don't know what they're teaching them now, but God bless them. It, it just seems like now it's more of like a college life, you know. So if it's okay with you, we're, you come out of academy, I know you probably have a million stories to tell. That come. When did you become a detective for homicide? How many years on the job? March 20, nine and a half years. Nine it was March years, 23rd, 1981. I'm sure like every officer's got a hundred stories, but let's get to the detective part. You become a detective. Are you a sergeant or are you just a regular? I'm a regular deputy. Uh, homicide was predominantly sergeants. Uh, 1981, July 1st, they had the union to just bargain something. So deputies in order to work homicide, that's homicide was called a coveted position. So if you get there, it's a testing. You have to test to get into homicide. When I went there in March, there was no test. I just there. Now I'm grandfathered in as a bonus too, which means I'm getting paid top step sergeant's pay. Okay. So now it's a coveted position. So now people going in there have to do that. Much harder to get into. Uh, it took an average of 15 years for anybody to get into homicide bureau uh, within our department because we don't have homicide detectives at every station. One central homicide bureau and they, wherever you're murdered, when you're on call, wherever it's at, that's where you go. And so it's hard to get up there. I was up there nine and a half years because I had an expertise in gangs and they were starting a gang homicide crew. That's why I got up there okay. when I did. So just strictly investigating gang homicides? Yes, when I first went up, first three years in homicide bureau, strictly gangs. Okay. So leading up to that, um, we want to get to Richard Ramirez and the Night Stalker. Are you, when that case comes in front of you, are you still a sergeant? Are you a lieutenant? I'm, now? I'm still, I'm, no, no, I'm still a deputy, bonus two. Uh, so essentially, a sergeant. Okay. Because I'm getting top set sergeant pay. And that case, back then, we worked off of beepers, we pagers. Right, 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 right. And so, Page, hey, you got a call, 8510 Village Lane, March 17th, 1985. Uh, city of Rosemead, uh, Dale Okazaki met her untimely demise, and Maria Hernandez survived the gunshot victim, as a gunshot victim. And that was the first? That was the first case. Now, I don't know, I, I've never been a detective, I had 22 years on the police department. What makes it a serial killer? How many homicides? Three. Three. But what you think is the same person, the same crew. Yes. Um, three homicides. Is that the same here in Chicago, pretty much? Well, I mean, we had a real famous serial killer, John Wayne Gacy. Right. That was before my time. And then uh, there was a Inglewood rapist um, that was uh, killing prostitutes. And right. That was a series, and they did a real nice job. You know. It's pretty much right. a standard throughout the nation. Is it? Yeah, that's what they classified. Three, three homicides perpetrated by the same man, three or more would be considered a serial killer. Okay, so tell us about that. I mean, how it came about, how you figured out it was the same guy or a serial killer. I know you, watching one of your documentaries, The Night Stalker, they didn't believe it was the same guy killing people and kidnapping kids, is that correct? That's correct. Explain to our audience The Night Stalker, who he is, what he did, you know, everything about him. That the you the Night Stalker, about. first off, his name was Richard Ramirez. We identified him as positively Richard Ramirez. He's an individual, he was a drifter that came from El Paso, Texas. They came out in the summer of 1985, which was a very hot summer for us in California, where he killed 14 people, uh, kidnapped about five or six kids, sexually assaulted them, and uh, he was captured. The first one happened March 17th of 85. He was captured and arrested on August 31st. He was convicted in 1989, where he was sentenced to death. Uh, on June 7th of 2013, he met his untimely demise while in custody, dying of natural causes due to cancer. Uh, the Night Stalker name itself came, uh, the news media would call up and say, what do you, do you have a name for this guy yet? And we'd say, and I'd tell him, yes, we do. And he said, what is it? We said, we're calling him suspect. And they're the ones that gave him a name. There was a midnight, Marauder, Midnight Intruder, but he, when he went down to Mission Viejo, he liked the Night Stalker name, and because somebody in the press called him Night Stalker, and he went down, we hit Mission Viejo, and he thought he left somebody for dead, but she survived. Uh, he said, tell him I was here. Tell him it was Night Stalker. Really? Yeah, so he liked the name. Uh, it was 
where the, the case, there was real no method of operation. Or what they call this MO or modus operandi because his only consistency was his inconsistency. Uh, he used guns, knives, shod foot, manual, ligature strangulation, blood force trauma. Uh, his victims range in age from five to 73, I believe. Wow. So it, it, was, it was a tough case. The challenge, to the, the case itself, why so detailed, why I, why I still get asked to go talk about the case all around the nation is because of his inconsistencies. And it's hard, uh, you know, here in Chicago, if you got some guy that's killing with a nine millimeter gun, and all of a sudden you got somebody that's killed with a 22, you say, oh, that's not the same guy, it's a 22 caliber gun. Well, he was using different methods to kill, of, people. Uh, to kill people with. Uh, there, at that time, the FBI used to classify them as organized and disorganized serial killers. Disorganized guy is a guy that you, takes weapons from inside the residence or inside the location he's at, weapons of opportunity. Organized, carried weapons on him and went in there and did his business. Richard was both. Richard will tell you that he had two guns on him every time he went inside of a house, yet sometimes he used his shot, his shot foot, his fist, strangulation, knives from inside the residence. So there, the fact that he was doing so many different methods and ways, that's, that's what made it extremely difficult to put it all on one guy. Matter of fact, two psychologists, world-renowned psychologists, one from UCLA and one from New York, said that the mere fact that I was alleging that one man was responsible was just blowing hot air, because not one man had ever been documented doing that stuff. So we proved them all wrong. You said that Richard Ramirez was well-versed, well-read. Yes. And it seemed like he, he followed serial killer patterns, not, excuse me, not patterns, but Histories or yeah. history of uh, serial killers. Do you think that it was purposeful what he was doing in that disorganized manner, or is it something that just came about? Questions like that would be for some doctor who I don't trust to give answers. I, I don't know. You know, Richard asked me, why do you think I'm like this? And I just, my response was, if I had the answer to that, I'd be a doctor getting paid a lot more money than I am as a cop. I don't know. My job was to gather facts, present them, and convict them, and that's what we did. I can't answer her. I, I get answered questions. I get asked questions like that all the time, and I refuse to speculate. Well, he never spoke on it when you interviewed him. He didn't no. Say, he asked. He wanted to know. He asked me why he did it. I, I don't know. And, and did he ever say why? You, you did say that you understood why he was doing the things he did, but was it because he explained it, or what was the history behind him that? No, he, he understood. Was, I understood why he was doing it because he was a sexual deviant. He was. Orgasming, he was reaching orgasm, reaching climax. You know, that's why he did it. You know, that to me was, I understand, that was sex to him. I give you, a, maybe you'll understand it this way. I give you a place in Mammoth, up in the mountains, snow, flickering fireplace, wine, soft music, white bearskin rug, no cell phones, no public telephones, no kids, no bill collectors, no nothing, just you and that special member that you want to be with of society. Soft music. Now, you're fresh out of the shower, both of you appropriately dressed for the evening, just you and that special someone. That sounds like a sexual interlude to me where it's going to turn into raw and adulterated sexual intercourse. That's easy for you to understand because that's you. Now I give you a man that can't afford him a night in Mammoth, doesn't have a flickering fireplace, doesn't have a bottle of Cabernet, so when you know he's got a bottle of white port in his pocket, doesn't have a flickering fireplace, but he's got a book of matches. And he's got his own member in his own hand, and he's an act of masturbation, because he just set the hills of Mount on fire. He's a pyromaniac. That is sex to him. So if you understand that, that's what I mean. That's what made him do it. That was sex. Pointing the gun at somebody, that's sex. It doesn't mean he's going to orgasm over it, but that is building up, that foreplay for him. And that's what I learned from Bob Morneau, the foreplay. Oh. Uh, all the knowledge on that case I gained from a retired FBI agent by the name of Dr. Robert Morneau. I took two uh, semesters of advanced criminal investigation pertaining to sex crimes from him at Cal State LA. And he professed, you know, he'd tell you something about a sex crime, and he'd say any reasonable 
and prudent sex crime investigator would recognize that right away where others wouldn't. Well, that's what I was seeing. From the very first murder, he walked up on Maria Hernandez in the garage and he made a deliberate noise. He slammed his hand against the car. He wanted her to see him. And why? Because Morneau will say a sexual deviant, when somebody points a gun in your face, they're really, you know, like a little lady or someone you're right here and you're there and it's getting you excited seeing the fear in their eyes. That gets them off. That's okay. sexual. That's a sign of sexual deviancy. And that's what he did with Maria. Is that where he saw the ACDC hat? Yes. Is that the one? Okay. And so, and then her roommate, Dale Okazaki, at autopsy, we see that she's got a contusion in the back of the head. He hit her in the back of the head. Why didn't he kill her right there? No, he waited until she went, she was on the ground, it was quiet. She put her hands on her kitchen counter and she lifted her head up. And when she lifted her head up, Richard said she was stupid. She lifted her head up and he's right there on the other, with a gun at the other end of the counter and shot her right in the running lights. And so why didn't he just kill her when she was down on the ground? Yeah. I'm sitting there and this guy wanted to see his fear. There's something to this. He went out of the room. He went, he exited from the living room door. So that's in front of the condo now. Maria Hernandez had hit the garage door over because the bullet struck a, her set of keys and lodged in her hand and didn't exit. And she went out, she went around, she hears a gunshot. So she goes around to the front. When she goes around to the front, she's just as surprised as he is. He sees her and she sees him. And they start playing cat and mouse around a Volkswagen bug right there. And finally, she just throws her hands in the air and says, don't shoot me again, you've already shot me. And he just put the gun by his side and walked away. He didn't run, he walked away. Really? And I'm sitting there saying, he didn't see the fear in her eyes anymore. There wasn't any more challenge. She pretty much like gave up. Yeah. Like either. And so we learned the next day, 40 minutes later, there's a gal curl uh, Silent you that was killed in Monterey Park and when the cops got there to that one they figured the neighbors called in boyfriend girlfriend disturbance so they got there Richard and her had been yelling at each other and he stopped her she was in a panic reverse she backed and she backed her car up into a parked car so she's stuck now and when Richard came up to her instead of shooting her right there in the car he drug her out and he shot her in the side of the abdomen twice now I'm sitting there saying, why didn't he shoot her while he's in the car? Yeah. And so there's something different. And then we had the kidnapping of the kids, the physical description, the kids didn't die. And their physical descriptions and description by surviving victims like such as Maria Hernandez, uh, they look the same, they sound the same. In their physical descriptions, tall, thin, light-skinned Hispanic or Caucasian, uh, stained gap, the brown teeth, uh, disheveled hair, and a very pungent odor to them. And uh, so everybody's saying the same thing. And then we had the shoe print that showed up uh, March 29th, and that one was the shoe print of the Avia shoe, which when we finally latch onto that, and as meticulous as we get in. The Bureau, we, I can tell you without equivocation today that 1,356 pair of Model 440B has arrived in New York from Taiwan for distribution throughout the U.S., of which six pair ended up in the state of California. One pair ended up in the city of Los Angeles. Okay. So that's some, that's some heavy piece of evidence, and we found footprints. So now when you're finding footprints by kids, you're finding physical descriptions, it's easy to say one man. Now, I don't blame those guys that didn't believe in me because in law enforcement, you learn that everything is predicated on criminal history. Nobody in criminal history had ever been documented doing the things that I was alleging Richard was doing. So I therefore became the young punk, the young Mexican trying to make a name for himself. They didn't believe it. The cops didn't believe it. If I'd have been in their shoes, I w probably wouldn't have believed it. I wouldn't call go to name calling, but so be it, shame on them. And then as it turns out, uh, in the documentary, you actually hear Frank Sinerno saying, Gil was right, and I was right. Yeah. And so once we got on the same page, then work became easier.
No, Richard Ramirez wasn't killing the kids? No. He didn't kill any of them? He killed one in San Francisco. We didn't find out about that till after I was retired. Okay. Uh, June 10th, they did them on DNA. We didn't have DNA back then, remember? Right, right. Um, so how many murders has he? We filed 14 murders. 14? San Francisco filed one. I know he was good for two up there. Now with a kid, now in three. One, they were afraid to file, they didn't file it. Uh, but it didn't make a difference because once we convicted him, he never went to trial up there at all anyway. Yeah. They got him, they, they were, they're, I wanna say that their DA, there was a guy named Arlo Smith and he was running for DA again and the word on Arlo was he was soft on crime. So, politically, he announced that he was going to use multiple murders against Richard. That way it would be a death penalty case. Well, he had to use the murders from down south in Southern California, and I was dead set against that. And I would have, offer them no assistance. I wouldn't do anything because by the time their trial would come to fruition, it would have been about 10 years after the case happened down here. And so if any of the surviving victims or witnesses change their testimony up there, would help out for an appeal for Richard on our case in chief. So uh, we didn't go up there and they decided to strike a deal with Richard. He would waive time and they would only file it if he won an appeal against us in LA, then they would file theirs and proceed with theirs first. But he so didn't win his appeal. Can you describe the fear that was going through California right there, that area. I mean, was the news blasting this out? The news had people in a panic. Uh, people were buying guns, people were buying alarm systems, people were doing everything, buying dogs, anything they could. I particularly, uh, I watched the documentary and I had a, actually had to apologize to my wife because during that time I had three kids. They were seven, 10 and 13. And my wife and kids, my wife took the kids and got out of the house on August 8th. She said, that's it, we're leaving. Not coming back till, he's in, they till this is over. The, uh, they would either go to my mom's house or her mom's house and appear to be safer in numbers like that. Right, right. And uh, so she packed up her stuff and left. And it was much easier on me. And I, at, I started to say, I watched the documentary I had to apologize to her after because during the time that I was working the case, my job was to catch the killer. Her job was the house and the kids. Right. The one thing that I hadn't factored in there was the fear factor. I have a gun and I have partners and I wasn't fearful of nothing. Right. She didn't have me who she depended on to save her, be her hero, be right. the, Just the, know, protector. the protector. And I wasn't there. And there was an awful lot of stress. And she caught, one day I talked to her, I wanted to check on the kids, all the kids, and she told me, she caught my daughter crying in the room. And I said, what, were you, what was she crying about? And she says, oh, nothing, mom. She said, no, no, what are you crying about? And she says, I just want my daddy home. Yeah. And I said, okay, I gotta go. And I hung up and I started cussing. And I was cussing, I was angry at my wife because I'm sitting there telling my partner, doesn't she realize that I've got the weight of the world on my shoulders right now. I've got to, we've got to catch this guy because, to protect my own family, mm -hmm. much less family, mother, or siblings, friends, neighbors. There, the pressure to capture this guy was on us. How many and hours she a didn't day understand. are you guys working at this point? The, the captain is quoted as saying we're working uh, 16, 18 hours a day, seven days a week, which was totally sure. against federal standards. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that that's what we were doing. Yeah, well, that's hey, what it people took. People realize you got to do what you got to do. I mean, if it's... I, I tell everybody that ever wants to come to work homicide, uh, I just advise them. You have to understand to be a good homicide detective, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. Right. And you got to be willing to give Big it commitment. up. And if you can't, well, maybe this isn't a job for you. Right. Well, getting back to, you know, the fear that your family felt, the safety issue, I mean, he terrorized everybody in California, as you said. Sure. And um, remembering in the, in the documentary where I believe that I heard that, wasn't there a murder that was very close to your own home? That was August 8th. I live in the community of Roland Heights. This was in the community of Diamond Bar, which is the city next door. That's the morning she moved out. 
I, they, they call me up and she, she says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Diamond Bar. And she said, Gil, that's nothing to play around with because I often lie and joke. And, and I said, I'm not joking. Now I got to go in, you know, the three S's, shower, shave, and I forget what the third one is. And I come back, should, you know, should there you go, shave. shit, shower, shave. Uh, <laughs> right? I, I sit there and I she says, where are you going? And I opened up this archaic thing called the Thomas Guide. And I said, there's the address I wrote down. There it is, look. And I, she goes, oh my God, you are. And I said, yes, I told you I'm going there. And she's, and I said, now that you're up, I mean, you don't have to leave now, it's four in the morning. Go back to bed, but when you get up later on, I said, how about going to the store? And about two or three this afternoon, maybe, I'll give you a call, plenty of time. You just go get a bunch of stuff to make some lunch. And I'll bring about 20 people down here for lunch. And I affectionately call my wife, Sister Mary Clarence, because she's a religious one. She's nice. <laughs> no profanity. She looks at me, she says, bullshit. She says, we're leaving and we're not coming back till this is over with. And my 13-year-old reached, uh, stuck her head around the door, said, Mom, said, are we got brother and sister? She says, yes. Tell them not to worry about changing. Just get sweaters and we're, we're leaving. And she didn't even go get suitcase. She just put them in bag, like the bag lady. And she took off and didn't come yeah. back. I could imagine a family one through, you know, it's yeah. so close and to home. That's what I said after we watched it together. I just yeah. apologized. I had never thought about that and I was sad yeah. and I was sorry. You, you were overloaded, I imagine. Yeah. Which, you're not it was. Right. I still tell her we got the wrong guy. Maybe she'll get out for a week or two again. <laughs> So, all these murders, he finally gets caught. Did you get a chance to interview him? Yes. What was that like? What was your, when you first seen him in person, can you describe that? Like, it was no different than looking at any other murder suspect. Really? You, you know, you, you have, uh, I use the analogy, a uh, Manning, big time professional quarterback, off that field, he's just daddy and he's a friend and he goes out barbecuing, drinking with his buddies, doing whatever he does. Mm -hmm. And, but come Sunday, it's game time. Game face is on, he's a quarterback. He's thinking of nothing else but that game. Total commitment, not thinking about kids, his wife, any, total commitment to the game. When I went to interview Richard, it was game time. I knew what job I had to do. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to talk to him. I needed to get him to talk. I didn't have time to, you know, God, you know, this is a big case. This is it? I just knew what I had to do. And so when I went in there, there wasn't any difference. You know, say, weren't you scared because he was demonic? He was into the devil worship and this. No, he's human. That's all he was to me was human. And so we went in there and we talked. And as it turns out, he ended up liking me cult because of the culture. And I could talk street talk with him and we could talk and we were both Hispanic. So he got along with me. He called uh, me Gil, I called him Rich. And he called my partner, Mr. Salerno, because Rich is well read. And he says, Gil, I got a quote him. He says, Gil, I got an ego that will fill this room. And I can tell you everything about serial killers from the time the Romans fed the Christians to the lions to the modern day serial killer. This is Ramirez telling me that. That's Ramirez telling me that. And I, I said, Rich, I mean, wh what's up? You, you call me Gil, you call my partner Mr. Salerno. I said, what'd you think? He was seven foot tall and hovered. He puts his pants on one leg at a time, just like you and me, brother. And he goes, no, but that's Mr. Salerno. He worked on the Hillside Strangler. And he knew all this shit about Frank. Yeah. And so he was awestruck with him. And I thought he was going to get his jollies off just because we told him we put him in the same room that... Uh, Angelo Bono was in, who was a hillside strangler. And he was all excited, he was in the same room. Okay. Yeah, so he was, he was a character, but he was just, and more articulate than any other homicide, any other suspect I've ever interviewed. Really, but he just, poor hygiene, poor? That's it, he didn't yeah. stink that, but he had poor hygiene, his teeth were decayed, that's where the brown gap stained teeth came right. from. His hair, you know, at the time, first time we saw him, he had had that turban, you know, they bandaged him up because he was bleeding, he had a cut in his head. Didn't the civilians get a hold of him? Yes, he was trying to carjack uh, a female. She screamed, her husband came out. Good family back in that area. Good guys carried pipes and two by fours. Bad guys all carried guns. Too early in the morning for the bad guys to be awake though. They're, you know, they're, right. they're late sleepers. He heard his wife screaming, he grabbed the pipe and gave him 
couple of taps on the head. The neighbors heard the commotion. They saw their neighbor fighting off Richard. They then go after him. Richard had been running already just to that point about two miles over the five freeway, over sound barrier walls, over walls, backyards, running because he knew they were chasing him now. Do and they know who he is? No, they don't know who he is initially. That's fucking that's just, crazy. That's just somebody that's messing with one of our neighbors. Right. So they got there and they didn't beat the shit up. They just stood around him and held him till the cops got there. The cop got there. The first deputy sheriff to get to him was a guy named Andy Ramirez, Andres really? Ramirez. He got there. He didn't know who he was at first. Yeah, but at this point, do you have a, a great uh, deposit of him, like a sketch, like what he looks like? We put out a picture of him Friday, August 30th in the late news. This is Saturday, August 31st in the morning. So they might not even seen it. They may not have seen even it. the officers like, okay, we know we, The officers knew it because we put out thousands of pictures to every cop, every okay. station, get it out there, look at this guy. He just, matter of fact, history tells me, I heard that he was hung over. They had had a little party the night before. The officer was? Yeah. <laughs> and so he wasn't hitting on all cylinders. And, but he got him, put him in his radio car, and it's right across jurisdictional lines. He was in the county area. Half a block west was the jurisdictional line for LAPD. Oh. So the Blue Meanies came up in force. They had three cars come up because they'd been following 911 calls because he had been coming from the city side running into the county. And there's a uh, gentleman by the name of George, uh, George Lopez. Not the comedian George Lopez. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny. cop, George Lopez, and he comes up and he says, yeah, that's the guy we're chasing. Open up the cop's door. Didn't have the decency, George, to take off his handcuffs and trade handcuffs. with. He says, get him out of here. And they put him in an LAPD car and they whisked him off. No shit. And the guys from East LA saying the deputies wanted to kick Andy's booty. You know, they're saying, hey, the biggest arrest in the history of the county and you let the meanies take him? Right. You know, he... So I'll tell you what, I know in Chicago, no one's taking no one out of my fucking car unless the supervisor tells me to let him out. Yeah. No other coppers taking him out, no other jurisdictions taking him out. Yeah, they... That's not how we work. They, they just, they didn't yeah. ask, they didn't do anything, they just opened the door and take him. Right. And now, so, at that time, what's Andy got on the job, do you know? How much time? Oh, he was a rookie. He was a rookie. Yeah, he was okay, a rookie. So he, he was, was doing he was, better. Yeah, he was working he was a, a one-man uh, day car, which is what you do. You train on, in the evenings or on, on graveyard, you'll see a two-man car. Your first job right after that is go to a one-man day car, and that's what Andy was working. Yeah, so that, that explains that. Sure. You're doing a job, especially working 99 by yourself, second-guessing yourself, should I do it, no. or should I do? I laughed. I laughed at the deputies because I said, come on, guys. If, it, if the shoe would have been on the other foot and you chase him into the city, you'd have done the same damn sure. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, was, arrested, yeah. I thought it was funny. In my book, hey, the guy's caught. Who cares? Right. At that point. That, yeah. yeah. And then we went, they took him to Holland Back Station, which was an LAPD station. And when I got there, uh, there was Lieutenant Lewis, who was a homicide, uh, it was a robbery homicide uh, lieutenant at the time. He says, Gil, he's in the back room. He's all yours. You guys make the, you know, we, we were calling the shots because we had the majority cases. So it was yeah. our case. So they were, he acquiesced. I said, first thing. Get this floor, get everybody out of here. Because it was like a party going on. They had a no. bunch of cops up there. And I said, get them all out of here. Imagine. Yeah, you know, and then went in and I just peeked my head in there. And as soon as I saw him, I said, that's him. I knew that was him. Uh, just to make absolutely sure, we had somebody from our late prints come over. They rolled some prints to confirm that it was the guy we were looking for. And the rest is history. Wow. At this point, when they were chasing through the streets in that time frame, did you have a name? For the suspect he's looking for? Did yeah, we had named, they released it publicly they did. Friday, August 30th. Okay. They released it publicly. We had possibly identified him about three in the afternoon. And when we did it, uh, they, they made a decision whether they were going to release. They said, well, the captain came to Frank Salerno, my partner, and myself and said, What do you think? They're going to talk about releasing names. I said, Well, give us 24 hours before you release it, mm -hmm. and we'll have them. And he went down, he came back up, and he said, we lose. And the thought behind it was, if he kills again tonight, and we knew who it was, we didn't put it out, shame on us. And he was right. Yeah. So your decision would have been to keep it 
to yourselves at this point in order to grab them. Yes, and because if, he's, I, if he sees it, then it's going to be a chase sure. to who knows where. And you've already had a problem in San Francisco, right? I mean, with evidence and information being led up. The mayor had, Mayor Feinstein had released some information that was confidential. It was not for public consumption. Uh, we had had problems with one of the other departments holding back and not doing the right thing. So just when you're chasing anybody, much tougher. So Gil, he sentenced to death, Richard Ramirez. Yes. At any time, does he show any remorse about anything he's done? He showed remorse uh, to me twice during the entire case. Uh, one is remorseful over one of our surviving victims, how she how she was doing, asked us to get her a message that he was sorry. Which one was that? Which victim do you remember? Yeah, I do. Whitney Bennett. Okay. And she was a 16-year-old girl at the time. She's a flourishing. I just saw her last week. Beautiful lady. Uh, three was beautiful she the one kids. Was in the documentary? As an no, woman? no, oh, she no, wasn't? no. That was. Uh, Anastasia Ronas, okay. a beautiful young, beautiful six-year-old girl, sharpest girl I've ever met, and we're friends today. The only problem with her is she's a San Diego Padres fan. <laughs> and, uh, aside from that, but it's a friendly rival. And you're right? a White Sox fan. Uh, oh, you're killing me, Smalls. <laughs> and the other thing he was uh, sad about was one of the ten-year-old uh, girls that he kidnapped out of the house. Uh, the night that he kidnapped her, a little puppy got out of the house, and he was concerned about the little puppy. Really? Yeah, so Weirdest thing, just right? different, uh, different strokes. Yeah. Uh, there was that, but I remember, and attorneys, we used to have a constant changeover. People just want to see part of the case that's going on. This was history. And there were two attorneys, females, that were dressed to the tens, gorgeous could have stepped right out of any magazine, modeling magazine, for clothes. They were impeccably dressed, beautiful ladies. And Richard always had did the same thing. When he walked into court, he glanced at people sitting down that were watching. He'd pick one out of the herd, and that was the one he's going to check out when he's done. He'd sit there with his back. When it's time to leave again, his eyes would go no place else other than the, that lady. And get a smile, you know, somebody's giving her full attention. Well, these two ladies were sitting on the one right next to the other. One one had the edge row. She had the edge seat. And I, I got called. The bailiff said, hey, you got a phone call over here. So I go to the bailiff's desk. And as Richard goes walking out, one of the, he looks at her. He had seen her earlier. He smiles at her. She blew him a kiss and opened up her legs so he could get a good shot. Really? And I went back and told my partner, I said, shit, hook me up. Let's see if it'll work for me. You know, so they were followers. Yeah. What made them do it? Because I didn't talk to anyone. I have no idea. I don't know if they were getting thrilled at it, if they were just pulling his piñata. You know, what, why they did it, what drove them to it. There was one girl, uh, Bernadette. I don't remember what her last name was. She was a little Filipino girl. She was there every day of the preliminary hearing. She used to go every day. And I asked him one day, I said, hey, whatever happened to Bernadette? He says, ah, she came down here. She used to visit me all the time, trying to convert me back into Catholicism. I said, and? He says, nah, it didn't work. He says, and I talked to her. Last I heard, now she's doing porn. <laughs> I talked her into it. So. Did any of the detectives investigating the case get any fan mail? Uh, no, no. We, matter of fact, one day, one of the alternate jurors took in a bunch of cookies for the defense team, for the judge, for the clerks. Everything. Didn't offer one to the no, cops. Really. No, really. we were the enemy. So Gil, you, you, real quick, it's not so much about Richard Ramirez right now, I'm going to give you a little kudos. You're the first lieutenant Hispanic to ever become a... I was the first, first Hispanic above the rank of sergeant to ever work sheriff's homicide, and they just had their 100 year anniversary uh, last Thursday. Okay. And back then, I was the first one. Now, since that time, they've had other lieutenants, and they had a captain, a good friend of mine. Was Did you there. get a lot of shit back in the day, being Hispanic, being on the place, or...? No, not really, no because jokes, no. no, you know, back then when I was a cop, you didn't look at brown, black, or white. Okay. You were all brothers. You were all cops. You know, it didn't make a difference. Right. You know, and if it did, if they did make fun of me because I was Mexican, because it 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 was wasn't offensive. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't offensive. You'd make fun of them because they were white. You know, right, or he right. was black or Chinese. Okay. You know, you, nobody cared about that. You didn't yeah. have to be politically correct back then. 
Right. That killed me more than anything else today, just the fact that you can't make fun of people. Right, right. You can't do that's kind of breaks a barrier. Sure. When you can make fun of each other, you know? You know, they always said once they stop making fun of you or picking on you, then it's time to worry. Yeah. Because then that's they they stop liking you. As long as they keep messing with you, you know you're on the right team. Yeah. yeah. Look at that kid. Oh boy. Yeah. Someone, I heard it somewhere, and it could be true or not true. Did you get called to a different country about a different serial killer? I've been called I, I, uh, not to a different country about killers out of the country. I've lectured in different countries. Oh, okay. uh, I did get called. Whenever, whenever there's serial code around, somebody will call for help. I was, uh, they asked me to go back and advise him on the BTK killer, bind him, torture, kill him. I went back mm -hmm. there. Uh, matter of fact, about a month before I was scheduled to go back there to help him out, a few weeks, uh, they captured him. And I said, I called him as well, I, all bets are off, you don't need me anymore. And they said, oh, no, no, we still want you to come out and help us out because we still have prosecutors. We want to know what kind of problems we can run in prosecutorial. Not only that, we've scheduled a, a seminar. And we hadn't told you yet, but we're asking you to speak at the seminar uh, to help out other cops out here. So. I, I've done that when Versace got killed, you know, they're they calling me, you know, for, there's been a few of them, uh, okay. they call and ask for help. Is there anything else you'd like to bring up while we're talking, any more questions for them? I, 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 I thank everybody, especially uh, you for bringing me out here, I'm, I'm grateful. I do the, uh, want everybody, all your viewers, listen to George, oh my God, George Lopez, oh my God. High podcast I what that's like. I mean, because I, I'm doing, uh, he calls me his co host. I'm the co host for the George Lopez Oh My God High podcast. Okay. It is, I have more fun than the listeners do listening, and it, it, it's great. Real quick, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. There's a lot of speculation. I don't know if you heard this, but that, and I want to clarify this because I heard it's not true that George Lopez is like anti police, anti veteran. Obviously, not. He's got, a, you know, that's, that's the, the myth. People think he's anti cop. Right. I'm here to tell you he's not. Okay. Uh, if he would, he certainly wouldn't have a veteran cop like myself as exactly. being his co-host. Exactly. And we just had uh, the sheriff of Los Angeles County as a guest on our show uh, just last week. Okay. So he is not anti-cop. That's awesome. That, that's good to hear. Because you hear rumors and bullshit and you don't know Sure. Really... We just well, heard it this morning. Before we go, we have a couple sponsors. We want to thank Blue Star Security behind us. He's going to buy his dinner tonight. Uh, the picture right there on the oh, side. Oh, sure. Here you are. Hey. Some new cadets. Yeah. Like. I was the um, highlight of my career, not this case. That day, I was asked to be a keynote speaker at a uh, graduation for our academy. Oh, nice! And that was just happened just before I gra I retired, and there I am. What a good-looking guy! Uh, <laughs> we I want to thank Hampton okay. by Hilton for uh, hosting you at their hotel, yeah. and uh, Supreme Whiskey Stones. He's an officer. Um, Hector Gonzalez. He made you a special glass. It's got the blue line flag on it, and it's got. Wow. Uh, your name with the Night Stalker on it. And we're going to get you another glass to match that one. Wow. Uh, very special glass. It's pretty cool. Also, one more question for you, Gil. Thank you. If Thank you. If you knew anybody coming on the job now or joining the, the military, what advice do you have for them? Uh, you know, times change. I remember when I came on the department, they said, ah, it's not like the old days, kid. You know, everybody, new generations, there's always new problems and the old heads always say, eh, eh. I'm thinking that uh, any new kid, anybody else come on a job, recommendation is, uh, number one, learn how to write, get, get your grammar down, because as you know, if it ain't documented in written form, it didn't happen. Number two, you have to have the infinite amount of understanding that everybody does something for a reason. You don't condone their actions. I understand why Richard was killing people. I understand why he was sexually uh, molesting kids. I don't condone it, but I understand it. If you understand it, it makes it a lot easier to accept and later on to talk with them. And third, third thing is treat people the way you'd like to be treated. You Very know, true. And, and just never forget where you came from. And if you do that, you got it. And never forget, you're nothing without somebody to support you. Whether it be a, a mother, a father, a friend, a wife, a girlfriend. A girlfriend that dumped you in Vietnam. A, a girlfriend that dumped me in Vietnam. <laughs> or an officer early in your life. That that's you that's right. Never yeah. never yeah, forget where exactly. you came from. And, oh, that was a great story. Uh, treat people the way you'd like to be treated. Yeah. 100%.
Well, I can say it was an honor sitting here talking to you. Thank well, you so much for coming to see us. Thank we you. We appreciate it so much. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate you. Al, all right. thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers. And we're all going to the White Sox-Dodger game tomorrow. May there the Dodgers go. come out victorious.